that's very, again, very different uh, from what we've usually done in the past. Uh, today we will uh, approach a, a topic quite contentious in the in tropical ecology and conservation biology in the form of a debate. And so I welcome Marcello Tavaredi, who will be the moderator for this debate. Thanks for the introduction and uh, just a minute. Sorry, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming for our debate. Uh, land sharing versus land despairing. Can we have both? Uh, I would like to give many thanks to Vitor Arroyo Rodriguez coordinating this process and our uh, speakers, debaters, uh, Ivete and Ben, for uh, accepting uh, the invitation. Uh, the debate is uh, organized in, in five uh, steps, a uh, quick introduction. Uh, questions for the audience. You are supposed to uh, vote uh, in, in our questions, uh, debate presentations and discussion, question for the audience, and, and final remarks. That's the basic structure you are going to follow uh, uh, this morning. Well, everybody knows uh, that you are now in the Anthropocene as uh, tropical habitats or every habitat in the planet has been highly modified by human uh, disturbance. In fact, the humans are reorganizing the biological systems from DNA to the ecological system is the major force uh, uh, organizing biodiversity. Uh, uh, Particularly in the tropical region, uh, you can briefly describe a human disturbance as human population are converting natural landscape into human modified landscapes via land use intensification. And this usually represents a gradient in terms of forest cover and uh, structural connectivity. It's a global uh, process. But in addition to habitat fragmentation, uh, remaining vegetation persists uh, uh, being exploited, uh, usually by forest-dependent people that depend on forest or, or vegetation resource for proper livelihood. They collect timber products or known uh, timber forest products folder, grazing by livestock, shift the cultivation. In fact, tropical uh, landscapes are exposed to uh, uh, a combined sources of uh, human uh, disturbance. Uh, as well documented by our colleague uh, Carlos Perez, even remote areas of old growth forest are supposed, are expected to be converted in human landscapes in the near future. This is the Amazon, it's Amazon region, 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers in 1975, in 1984, in 1990, and 1996, and 2004. So human modified landscapes or cultural landscapes or uh, biodiversity friendly landscape or smart landscapes, wherever you call this landscape, they are expected to provide, they are expected to protect biodiverse and cultural heritage, provide multiple ecosystem services, support human well-being, provide food, raw materials, and energy for an increasing global population. So human modified landscape is in charge of a lot of expectations. Uh, one possibility 
in terms of biodiverse conservation is just in setting apart pieces of the native ecosystem and using the matrix, using the remaining landscape very intensively to produce food or any material human populations uh, need. And it has been referred as land sparing, put apart areas for strict protection. Another option or another alternative or uh, completely different approach is permitting that native pieces and uh, human uh, agricultural lands coexist in the same space, what have been referred as land sharing, which is the best option. In fact, it's a very crucial response as you accept that the human are taking care of all tropical landscape, globally speaking. But these two opportunities, in fact, are highly controversial and highly complex, and that's the reason you are uh, discussing this, this, this topic uh, today. So I would like to ask you uh, for the questions. Now, I, I, it's my pleasure to ask you as audience uh, to vote in some perspectives. Uh, you are first presently for you, and after uh, the debate, of the, after the presentations, you are able to think again about your answer and give a second vote or change or vote in the end of this discussion. Uh, it's possible to upload the... So this is the first question. Eh? Which strategy do you think is most critical for conserving tropical biodiversity? Okay. Uh, Okay, this is the question. Which is the strategy do you think is most critical for conserving tropical biodiversity? And apparently the options uh, are in the... No? No? It's the first question, please. Some technological problem. That's it. So it's possible to upload this question. A lot of time for thinking about a very important answer. There is the information that the first question is not uh, available in this moment, so you can think a little bit about the answer, and and or and you are going to get back to this and vote again after some discussion, or you are going to discuss the way how to solve this. So, keep in mind 
the first question and your potential response to this. And please, you can go for the second question. The second question has disappeared <laughs> as well. OK. I hope everybody knows how to vote. You have more 20, 20 seconds for voting. Okay. Can you okay? Can you uh, go back to the introduction presentation, please? So it's now my pleasure uh, to briefly introduce our. Uh, two uh, speak, uh, speakers, uh, debaters, Dr. Ben Fallon and Dr. Uh, Dr. Yvette uh, uh, Perfecto. I am offered just a very quick introduction, but you want more information about this, uh, uh, these guys, it's available in, in his, uh, the personal homepage. Uh, ben Fallon is an ornithologist, conservation scientist, and research associate at Oregon State University. His research explores the impact of agriculture and forest management and biodiversity, and how to reconciliate or reconcile human demands for food, biofuel, and other products with conserving wild species. Uh, Dr. Yvette Perfecto is the George W. Peck Professor at the School of Natural Resource and Environment of the University of Michigan. She has 30 years of experience working on issues of agriculture and, and the environment and 25 years teaching courses on environmental issues at the University of Michigan. Uh, her research focuses on agroecology, biodiversity and ecosystem services, and uh, services in agricultural landscapes. So thank you a lot, uh, Ben and Yvette. And uh, I would like that you both come to the stage. And just to stimulate uh, the, uh, the presentations, the debate, and, and the discussion, uh, you have some stimulated questions, please. Thank you. I'm going to read quickly the question, and after that, Ben can uh, make your 10 minutes uh, talk. Does biodiversity benefit more from components of natural ecosystems embedded into product lands? Land sharing or large areas of natural vegetation isolated from productive lands, the land sparing. To what extent can the effectiveness of both strategies, sharing versus sparing, be generalized across ecosystems, temperate versus tropical forests, taxa, plants versus animals, and ecological groups, forest specialists versus forest generalists? Which could be the best strategies to improve the access to food and thus avoid hunger and malnourishment while prevent further deforestation. So Ben, 
Thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Marcelo, for that kind introduction. Buenos dias, bon dia, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you to the organizers, and especially Victor, uh, for inviting me to be part of this debate today. What I'm hoping we can do this morning um, is to try and get to the heart of why this topic has been so contentious. And hopefully all of you will come away with a clearer understanding of both the value and the limitations of the land sparing, land sharing debate. So I'll just wait for my, my slides to appear. Um, to start, I'm going to explain why I think the land sparing, land sharing continuum is a useful way of framing the question of how to produce food with least impact on other species. And I think that will be easier with the slides. And I guess because we lost that first question, we won't find out who actually won the debate. Um, slightly disappointing, but maybe also a bit of a relief. OK, great. Thank you. So the land sparing sharing framework um, identifies two main directions for reconciling conservation with uh, food production. Land sharing is about integrating conservation and production on the same areas of land. And the focus is really on increasing on-farm biodiversity, even if that comes at the cost of reducing yields and requiring a larger production area. Land sparing is about separating conservation and production on different areas of land. And here the focus is on protecting or restoring as large an area of native vegetation as possible, even if that requires higher yielding, less biodiversity, friendly methods for food production. And then there's a continuum of choices between these two with varying degrees of both integration and separation. So we know that native vegetation is good for wild species, but not so great for food production per hectare. And we know that the most high yielding farmlands are good for food production, but they don't support many species. So to understand what sorts of landscapes will be best for reconciling conservation and food production, what we really most need to understand are the farmlands in the middle. To some, farmlands like this are the answer to our dilemma. Mosaics, rustic agroforestry, and shifting, agri shifting cultivation produce food, and they also support many species. And so they're often seen as being good for biodiversity. What the land sharing, land sparing framework does is to interrogate what this statement means. Rather than seeing farming systems as either benign or destructive, it recognizes that their outcomes are more complex. So how good are they for biodiversity? Well, we can go out and measure that in terms of population abundance. Good for what species? Do they support the specialists, endemics, and species of conservation concern, or mainly more widespread and adaptable generalist species? Good compared to what reference? So the land sparing sharing framework provides a way of comparing both the production and the conservation outcomes of an area of farmland with the full range of options in a landscape from intact natural habitats all the way through to high yielding farmland. And finally, good at what cost? If the most biodiversity friendly farmlands are low yielding, then more land and more deforestation is likely to be needed at any given level of production. So when I and others have gone into the field to collect data on how the population densities of hundreds of individual species respond to changes in yields, this is what we found. The bars summarize the percentage of species of uh, birds, insects, and, and plants um, that would have the largest population under various different strategies. The species in red are those that would have a higher population if food is produced from as small a land area as possible, while sparing as much land as possible for native vegetation. Those in purple or blue 
are those which would benefit from some level of integration of conservation and food production on the same land. And then there are some species which benefit from agriculture. These are species we call winter species in white, and they tend to be of low conservation concern. What we can see is that the majority of species would fare better under land sparing in both forest and grassland biomes, and in studies ranging from the tropics to temperate areas. So most species in the places we've studied will have larger populations if food is produced on as small an area as possible, while sparing as large an area of native vegetation as possible. And it's important to note that this is not a conclusion you can get to using species richness, because that ignores species identity and abundance. You have to understand each species response one by one. So why do we see these results? Probably because most species are relatively specialized and rare, and so don't do well even in the most benign modified landscapes. Also because farming tends to eliminate niches by diverting as much of the land, water, light, and nutrients as possible into products for human consumption. This makes it hard, or perhaps even impossible, to generate high agricultural yields without severe impacts on the native species of an area. We can use these data to predict the outcomes of a range of options for reconciling conservation and food production, organized along two axes, how much a region or landscape produces and how. I think it's clear to most of us why this panel at the bottom left is better for species persistence than this panel at the top right. All else being equal, a benign matrix is better than a hostile matrix. But all else is not equal. In the panels at the top, total production is twice that in the panels at the, on the bottom. So for a fair comparison, we should compare at the same level of production, so across the rows. And here, if we decrease yields on the top row, so moving from right to left, we start running out of options to conserve native vegetation. Of course, if we can find a way to reduce total production without just displacing it elsewhere, for example, by changing diets and reducing food waste, then we could move downwards and have a benign matrix and some native vegetation. So we could get back to here. But we could instead move downwards and to the right and actually spare more land for nature. And the data I've shown you indicate that if we want to conserve healthy populations of the full suite of original species, we should aim to move downwards and to the right on this plot to limit excess production and spare as much land as possible. Although the idea of a benign matrix is appealing, even the most apparently benign high-yielding farming systems are of limited value for the species that most need help. And the most biodiverse and high conservation value farming systems tend to have such low yields that they don't make a meaningful contribution to food production. So to give a quick example, David Williams and colleagues recently completed a study here in the Tizamine municipality a couple of hours east of Merida. Like the results I've shown from other places, most of the birds, dung beetles, and trees would have larger populations in scenarios where livestock production is concentrated on as small a land area as possible, and where as much native vegetation uh, as possible is conserved. Interestingly, high-yielding silver pastoral systems with legume species like leucina could be part of this land sparing strategy and could help to reduce some of the environmental impacts of livestock production. But the main value of the silver pastoral systems for biodiversity in this case is if they can be used to reduce the land area required for, for production, and not because they have in themselves much conservation value. So as more studies come in, like this one, that support the concept of land sparing, I think the debate has suffered from what we can call the elephant problem. You probably know the story of the blind men and the elephant. Each of the blind men is grasping a different part of a very patient elephant. To one, the elephant is like a snake, to another, like a spear, another, a giant leaf, and so on. The recounts appear to be in conflict with each other, but if they can stop arguing and put them all together, they'll have a better and more realistic picture 
of the elephant. In the same way, measuring how species densities respond to agricultural yields does not tell us what social model of farming to aim for. It doesn't tell us how we can improve human well-being or what governance system will be effective in actually ensuring that land is spared for nature. Importantly, it doesn't tell us about the economic concept of the rebound effect, because of which land sparing won't happen as a side effect of increasing yields, but only if specific measures are put in place. So rather than dismissing some research because it points towards answers that seem to contradict our own, it would be more productive to work on how to combine them. They're all parts of the same elephant. For example, if we know that conserving the full set of native species in a region primarily depends on minimizing the land area of farming and conserving or restoring as, as great an area of native vegetation as possible, and if we also know that the undermining of land rights and self-determination in local smallholder communities is one of the biggest threats to food security, can we find ways to support that community to assert their rights and also to produce food in ways that avoid further deforestation? I think that in many cases, we can. And I'm going to end on this positive note that what's needed is to work together towards solutions that make more space for nature, while also integrating all of the other complex issues involved in real-world landscapes. We can, to some extent, combine land sparing and land sharing. But really, the main thing that will determine how many species survive the next century will be how successfully we can use high-yielding agriculture not to produce more food, but to spare more land for other species. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for this uh, very stimulating uh, uh, presentation. And I would like to invite Yvette for her talk. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming to this debate. Um, and thanks for the organizers to, for inviting us. Um, I was asked to present the arguments in favor of land sharing. But in doing so, I first want to question the validity of the land sparing, land sharing framing as proposed by Green et al. in their article in 2005 and further elaborated by my colleague Ben Fallan here and in, in previous work. Then I will proceed with six points to support the idea that a diversified agroecological matrix is the best strategy for biodiversity conservation and food production in the long term. So in challenging uh, the land sparing, land sharing framing, there are three premises that need to be true for this uh, framing or framework to work. Um, first, the need to increase food production. Then uh, the idea that intensive agriculture produces more food than wildlife friendly agriculture. And finally, that land sparing does occur. So let me examine each one of these. Uh, the first false premise, in my opinion, is that we need to increase food production in order to satisfy the demand for food in the world's population. Now, the reality is that currently we produce 4,600 calories per person per day. This is almost double what is required by the World Health Organization. Uh, but almost a billion people in despite of this uh, high production of calories, a billion people are either hungry or severely malnourished in the world. Uh, this graph, put together by the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food System, led by Oliver the Shooter, um, in this graph we can see what happens to those 4,600 calories. Some are wasted, some are fed to animals, uh, but not to people. Hunger is not driven by food availability, but by poverty and lack of access to the food that is produced. The second premise is that intensive agriculture produces more food than diverse agroecological systems. Now, the fact is that diverse agroecological systems have been shown to be highly productive, and we can talk a little bit about that later. Uh, furthermore, 
of the food that people actually eat, not what goes to feeding cows or cars or industry, but food that people actually eat is produced by smallholders, fisher folks and urban gardeners. Indeed, uh, smallholders produce 50% of the food that people eat, the rice and beans uh, and, and yuca, etc., uh, in only a quarter of the land. And industrial agriculture using about 70%, 70, 75% of the land produces food for 30% of the population. Uh, the third far pro uh, false promise is that agricultural intensification programs actually result in land sparing. In, most, in the most comprehensive study to date of the impacts of agricultural intensification programs on land use, Engelson and Kamowitz presented 17 case studies from Latin America, Asia, and Africa. They found that 75% of the cases that actually show some effect showed increased deforestation, not decreased deforestation. This doesn't mean that land sparing doesn't occur. It does occur sometimes, but under very special conditions, under very special circumstances, and it is more the exception than the rule. Uh, so let me then uh, go to the second part of my talk, uh, and let me make the argument for the need to maintain a diverse agroecological matrix for long-term biodiversity conservation and food production. And here, I want to make six, six points. First, that, uh, and this is a very important point, there is no need to transform natural habitat to agriculture in order to produce enough food to feed the world. Second, that most habitats are fragmented. The third point is that local extinctions are natural and occur even in continuous habitats. The fourth is that local extinctions are counterbalanced by migrations, according to the metapopulation theory. Uh, therefore, the fifth point is that the agricultural matrix should be of high enough quality to allow movement of, um, of organisms among fragments. And the final point that I want to make is that small and medium scale agroecological farms create these high quality matrices. Now let me examine each one of these. Um, the first point, uh, that there's no need to cut more forests to produce sufficient food. I already talked about this, so I'm just not going to dwell on that and move on. The second point uh, is that with a few exceptions, for example, in the Amazon and the Congo Basin, most habitats are already fragmented. And therefore, we need to deal with this reality. This is the reality of, uh, of conservation, no? Now, the third point, the idea is uh, the idea that local extinctions are a natural process in population dynamics. And this is well established and widely accepted in ecology and evolution. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, local extinctions occur even in continuous habitat and in very large fragments. For example, Numark, uh, the study uh, of mammalian extinctions that Numark uh, conducted in Western North American national parks, they, they document, he documented extinctions even in the largest of the parks. That is like te more than 10,000 kilometer squares. This graph shows the number of extinctions and colonizations in 14 national parks in North America. Another study quickly becoming a classic is the study of amphibians at the E.S. George Reserve in Michigan. Over a 20-year period, Earl Warner and his colleagues surveyed amphibian populations in temporary and permanent ponds and recorded over 30 local extinctions. Which brings me to the fourth point, and that is that for long-term conservation, local extinctions should be counterbalanced with migrations. In spite of the 30 local extinction events in the E.S. George Reserve, today we still have the same 17 amphibian populations that Warner documented 20 years earlier, and that is because they, have, they were counterbalanced by colonization events as shown in this graph. 
Now, given that most habitats are fragmented and that local extinctions are natural processes, we need to maintain a metapopulation structure to prevent populations from becoming regionally extinct. Therefore, conservation biologists should be placing their efforts in the areas outside the natural habitats, that is the agriculture matrix. And this agriculture matrix should be of high enough quality to promote migrations among patches of forest. Why is this? Well, simply because without migration, local extinctions will turn into regional extinctions. For example, in a small, if a small tree frog uh, become extinct in this patch of forest that you see here in the forefront, um, in Brazil, uh, the probability that some individuals from another patch will recolonize this patch is very low if the matrix is a soybean monoculture with pesticide applications like this one. Likewise, uh, likewise in any of these kind of matrices. On the other hand, if the matrix is composed of low input diverse farming systems like the ones that you see here, the probability of recolonization is it should be higher. Which brings me to the sixth point and final point. That is, that is very likely that small and medium scale agroecological style farming creates a high quality matrix. Not only that, but these systems are the most likely to supply most of the food that people eat. One thing is certain, and that is that chemically intensive monocultures do not create quality matrices and do not provide the majority of the food that people eat. According to Altieri and Toledo, about 40 to 50% of small-scale farmers in the world today practice some sort of diverse agroecological systems. And the good news is that, um, is that uh, basically uh, many of these peasant farmers are organizing under the umbrella of a global peasant movement, La, La Via Campesina, and their agenda for food sovereignty includes conservation, the conservation of biodiversity at the landscape level, precisely uh, this, the, the type of landscapes that we would like to see um, to, to promote migration among the fragments. So uh, this diversified farming systems is one of the things that they're promoting. So in summary, In summary, first of all, I want to emphasize that we do not need to cut any more forests to produce enough food to feed the world or for people to feed themselves. Uh, and the second point is that the evidence on social, political, and ecological grounds suggests that in order to produce enough food and conserve biodiversity in the long run, we should promote transformation of the agricultural system to stimulate small and medium scale agroecological farming systems. These systems are the most likely to create high quality matrices that will allow movement among patches of forest, big and small, therefore maintaining populations as metapopulations and conserving biodiversity in the long term. These systems are also the most likely to produce the food that most people eat in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yvette, for this uh, provoking uh, ideas. And for the sake of learning, uh, uh, the both speakers have now time to make questions for each other, and uh, maybe two or three questions for every speaker. And I'd like to ask the speakers to keep the answers uh, uh, between two minutes. And maybe you should start with Ben. Sure. Um, so, Yvette, even the subset of species that manage to persist in agroforests and other possible model systems for land sharing are vulnerable to being lost from those systems in the future. So, for example, farmers tend to kill off tree species that they don't consider to be useful and replace them often with fast-growing, often non-native species. So I'm wondering if you can give some examples of how land sharing strategies could prevent this gradual erosion of remaining biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think first my argument uh, is not that species should be able 
to survive in the agriculture matrices forever. They, they're not necessarily uh, have to be source populations there. No, the idea is that at least they can mi migrate among fragments of forest to maintain the, the forest specialists. No? So it's not necessary to, for all the species to be able to survive in the agriculture, within the agricultural matrix. Um, then uh, my, my, other, my second point that I will make is that we can also stimulate uh, farmers to plant native species. I mean, obviously, the, there's, there needs to be some uh, uh, programs that will stimulate the, the planting of native species and the conservation of species within the agriculture areas. Uh, finally, my third point is that even though in these diverse agroecological systems you might not um, have maintain all the species or farmers might eliminate some of the native species, the situation is even worse in more intensified farming systems, no? And so there's certainly not, in, in intensive farming systems, there's certainly not native species, but no tree species. They eliminate all the tree species. So the main idea here is that the agriculture matrix basically provide a matrix that is more permeable for species to move across that landscape. Thanks, Yvette. Uh, and now your time, please. Okay, so I, given my question to you, Ben, is that given the vast amount of evidence uh, that isolated habitats uh, lose species, how can conservationists deal with the expected long-term and I'm, I emphasize long-term, the expected long-term extinctions that will occur if the land sparing strategy were widely implemented. So I guess the premise of this question is that more widespread adoption of land sparing would result in more isolated habitats. And I, I would question that and disagree with that premise. So the whole point of land sparing is to create more space for nature. Um, and if it were widely adopted, then I think we would end up with more areas of natural vegetation, bigger areas of natural vegetation, and therefore they're going to be closer together and they're more likely to be in contact with each other. So I think we could actually reduce isolation through a land sparing approach. Um, if we could increase natural vegetation to, for example, half a landscape, then the fact that the matrix might be quite hostile is no longer likely to be such an impediment for species to move from one patch to another. You're going to have larger source areas, more individuals traveling out from those, to other patches which are nearby. Um, so I don't think that connectivity would necessarily or even likely decline in a land sparing scenario. Um, can I, can I, you, sure. are you finished with the? Uh, well, I, 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 I'm just gonna mention that my reading of the literature on habitat fragmentation is that while um, isolation is important, the primary determinant of species persistence in landscapes is habitat amount. So I think that we should first focus on uh, stabilizing and then through restoration, uh, increasing habitat amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms of isolation, I think, I mean, I, I, I am from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is an island, okay? It's a, you know, compared to many of the patches of forest that we have in the world, it's a big area. And we have very reduced number of species because it's an island, no? And so the size, yes, of course, you have lower extinction rates, the bigger the size. That the, nobody's gonna question that. But it's still gonna be isolated if, if what you have around it is intensive agriculture, no? And I, I work in, um, in a coffee uh, farm in, in Mexico. We have a 45 hectare plot, and we have there more species of ants than in the entire island of Puerto Rico. So, and, and then the, other, the uh, other example that I will give you is the national parks in the United States, you know, in, in Canada. The biggest national parks are still having extinctions, and that's because of the isolation that they have. Uh, so, of course, you know, bigger areas are going to suffer less extinctions, but that's not going to prevent extinctions from happening.
So maybe to come back on that, um, I really don't see softening the matrix around those national parks in the United States, for example, as being enough of a solution to overcome that problem. I am more convinced by initiatives such as the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative, where they're actually trying to increase the amount of protected and wild lands uh, within a really broad swath um, to improve the ability of, of animals to be able to move between those areas, and also plants. And with climate change, that's going to be really important. There's a study uh, from the UK that shows it's an island, and protected areas within the UK are, are also islands. But it shows that protected areas are the sites where species of birds moving with climate change colonize first. So these, these nuclei of habitat within the landscape are actually incredibly important for improving connectivity, even if they are isolated from other areas of habitat by a long distance and, and even by, by ocean. No, well, I, I do agree. I do agree that having more fragments of forest and more, you know, more forest is beneficial. I mean, I think that the, the main issue here is the assumption that the only way we can achieve that is by intensifying agriculture, when very diverse farming systems can be very productive. And so I think that maybe this is a point of agreement that we can reach that it's that that we need to increase uh, the amount of native vegetation. I would say that minimally, minimally, we don't need to cut any more forests. No, minimally. The more forest and natural habitat, the better, of course. But how, the question is how we can do that. And I will argue that diverse farming systems can achieve that, and, and, a, and a matrix that is more diverse would be better for maintaining biodiversity in the long run. So I would certainly agree with you that we don't need to cut any more forest, um, but that's not what, that is not what is happening at the moment. So we still see very widespread deforestation um, and loss of other natural habitats, wetlands and grasslands, um, and degradation of those habitats happening around the world. So I think it needs to really become a top priority for those engaged in sustainable agriculture. And I don't see that at the moment. I, I had a look recently at the Via Campesina website, and as far as I could work out, their interest in biodiversity is pretty much in seed diversity and agrobiodiversity. Um, I didn't see the, the topic of deforestation even mentioned. Similarly for the organic movement, their main objective is reducing pesticide use and using uh, natural rather than synthetic inputs but they don't have very good control over land use change. I recently was involved in a study where we looked at the distribution of certified farms under organic and various other schemes, and we couldn't get any data whatsoever on the locations of those organic farms um, across the tropics. Without those locations, there's no way of telling whether those farms have been engaged in deforestation, and therefore no way of including that in the organic certification. So I think that for ending habitat clearance and ending deforestation to actually happen, that really needs to be incorporated as a, a high level objective um, in the aims of uh, those involved in sustainable agriculture. Okay. Um, you, know. <laughs> <laughs> you can change so, for the next question. We're or? getting <laughs> off the script here, but I think it's interesting. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> so the, the first issue of deforestation I mean, a lot of the deforestation that is happening in the world today is not for feeding people, okay. is for profit, mm -hmm. no? And so, I mean, that is a political issue. Um, and the, the other point is uh, related to La Via Campesina. And you don't see directly them talking about biodiversity conservation in their website, although I, I have worked with La Via Campesina and that's, that's something that they very much have in their, in their programs. But uh, you do see a very strong emphasis on agroecological systems and diverse farming systems because that is for their, their own livelihoods, no? Uh, they want to be able to produce without depending on external, external inputs. And pesticides is one of the main things that affect biodiversity. We tend to think about vegetation all the time and forests and all that, but pesticide application is one of the most detrimental uh, factors in biodiversity conservation. And so they're promoting these kinds of agroecological systems. Uh, I agree with you that it's not very well documented how uh, these uh, small scale, 
medium scale farmers are promoting agroecology, but there are a lot of initiatives going on throughout, especially in Latin America, a little bit less in Africa, and to some extent in Asia as well. Uh, but uh, there are, uh, in Latin America, people are beginning to talk about an agroecological revolution, no? There are a lot of people that are doing this kind of agriculture, and to some extent it's because it makes sense for them, you know, for their livelihoods. So I can certainly agree with you that reducing pesticide use is really important um, and very possible in, in many systems. We at the moment use far too many pesticides and even undermine pest control through that. So switching to more agroecological methods there, I, I, w I would certainly agree with. Um, you mentioned the fact that a lot of deforestation at the moment is happening not so much for food production, but for profit. And I, I also agree with you there. So where we're having large scale corporate land clearance um, to produce biofuels or to produce animal feed, both of which have very little value in terms of, of food security. Um, I think it's, it's pretty clear that the food production from those areas is, is not, that, not that high. Mm -hmm. um, and we should seek to find policies that, uh, that reduce that, that reduce the use of, of biofuels, and that also encourage diets to shift away from meat and other animal products. Um, in terms of achieving land sparing, I think that for, for companies, for agribusiness, regulation is the most important. So strengthening environmental regulation so that they're not replacing natural habitats. For smallholders, it's more complex. So for smallholders, um, their food security could be adversely affected by solely coming in with strong environmental regulations saying you can't clear here. So I think there also needs to be in parallel support to smallholders to increase their yields, including using agroecological methods, um, but also using the agronomic knowledge as well. Mm -hmm. Ben, your time for a question. Uh, sure. So I just wanted to ask whether you agree, Yvette, that species richness, which is blind to species identity and abundance, is an inadequate metric for assessing changes in the conservation value of modified habitats? Um, I would agree with you that species richness is inadequate because it doesn't reflect the composition of species. No? And, and it, it, it will... Um, you know, you can have in an agricultural system, you can have a high number of species that um, are more characteristic of disturbed habitats uh, than, um, than in, in, a, in a forest. And you might have the same number of species, but it doesn't necessarily uh, mean the same thing. So I completely agree with you. And I think that actually a lot of the work that we have been doing in, in trying to answer this question, land sparing versus land sharing, uh, is really inadequate, um, including my own work, no? Um, and certainly your work as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's inadequate because, because the, the main thing is not, I mean, what, what we're doing is a snapshot approach. We go to that fragment of forest in the middle of the soybean plantation and we sample biodiversity that is there at that point. And then we go to the, to the soybean plantation or the diversify agroforestry system and sample biodiversity and say, okay, this one has more than this, but the forests have more than that. And that doesn't tell us anything about long-term conservation. And it doesn't include the dynamics of those populations, no? And so I think that for long-term conservation, we certainly need to change our approach in research. And we need to examine uh, the movement of organisms. And even using tracking, you know, radio tracking, is not adequate because that gives give us a, a short uh, sp time span also is what's happening at the moment, no? I think it's better than just sampling biodiversity in, in like a snapshot approach, but it doesn't give us the full picture. I think that we need to move a little bit more toward population genetics approach uh, to conservation in terms of knowing the history, the genetic diversity that we find within the forest and within the, the, the uh, forest that are embedded in different kinds of matrices. That's the kind of study that I think we should be moving toward. But I certainly agree with you that, that biodiversity or species richness is not an adequate measure. Any comment? Yeah, so I, I, I would agree 
to an extent with you that the snapshot approach is, uh, is not sufficient um, and that methods like um, population genetics to look at connectivity between different areas can be, can be very useful. But I would like to push back a little bit on whether it's completely useless to go and, and do snapshot studies. So I think if you find in a, in a particular area large populations of most of the specialists or endemics of an area, I think it's quite likely that those are, are going to be source habitats, that those are going to be important habitats for those species. And the converse, if you go into an area and you find highly depleted populations, one or two individuals of a few of the specialists and endemics, probably those are lower quality habitats. So I think we can, we can certainly say something from the snapshot approach, even if it's not giving us a complete, as complete a picture as if we, we studied the area over a long period of time. Yeah, my, my response to that is um, extinction debt, you know? Yes, you can, you can find a species in a fragment of forest, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that species is going to be there, remain there forever. Of course, the density of the species will tell you a little bit more, but, um, but there are extinction deaths. There are species that are on their way to extinction, and we are recording them with uh, the, the sampling you know, that we do when we go to the forest and sample them. So I think that, especially because of that, the, the extinction that uh, we need to make sure that there is connectivity among the different uh, areas of natural habitat. So I'd certainly agree with that. I agree extinction debt is a huge concern. Uh, we need to improve connectivity. But softening the matrix is not the only way of improving connectivity. So we were talking uh, yesterday or a, a day ago um, about the remaining fragments of forest in the Mata Atlantica, in the uh, Alagoas Pernambuco center of endemism. And the largest remaining fragments there are about 3,000 hectares, really small areas of, of forest with a lot of endemic species right on the brink of extinction. And I don't see softening the matrix as being enough to save those species. I think the only thing that's going to save them in the long term is if we can restore large enough areas reduce degradation within those habitats, um, and provide those species with more habitat for them to survive into the future. So I think that we do need to worry about extinction debt, connectivity, but there are multiple ways of addressing that, of which the matrix is only one. Well, I, I will argue that actually the way to maintain, or the most likely way, a more realistic way to maintain biodiversity within those hundreds of thousands of fragments, because there are really uh, hundreds of thousands of these small fragments of forest in the Mata Atlantica, uh, I, would, I would argue that the most likely way to maintain those species is through an agroecological matrix that is diverse and will allow connectivity among those, those fragments. <laughs> but we need to do the studies. <laughs> The problem is that we don't have those kinds of studies, you know? And I think this is why, yeah, it's important to define what data we would need to answer that question and then to try and go out and collect it. So there's a challenge for everyone here. Yeah. <laughs> Your time, Yvette, if you want oh, okay. an extra um, question. Yeah. So, um, Yeah, you, you sort of talk a little bit about this, but I, I would like um, for you to give me more specific ways uh, of the kinds of social political arrangements uh, that would have to happen in order for the land sparing argument, I mean, for, in order for land sparing to actually occur. Because uh, you have to agree that most empirical studies do show that when there is land intensification, agricultural intensification, that results in more deforestation, not less. And your, your argument, the, the land sparing argument, is based on the premise that land sparing is going to occur. So what kind of, of social political arrangements you would see uh, have to happen for land sparing to actually occur? So I think that's a really important question. And I agree with you. Many of the studies um, have shown that when yields are increased in an area, when you have processes of agricultural intensification, local deforestation actually increases rather than decreasing. This is called the rebound effect. Um, so as farming becomes higher yielding, it may reduce food prices, and, and therefore people start consuming more. Um, it may also make farming more profitable, and therefore farmers want to expand more. 
But I think really what we're seeing there is that in the absence of conservation policies, conservation doesn't just happen by accident. Um, so increasing yields is not really a conservation intervention. It needs to be combined with specific measures to ensure that land sparing happens. Um, so I think what we need to do is to find ways of linking yield increases with sparing land for nature. That's really what land sparing is all about. Um, and I brought out a paper last year which looks at some possible mechanisms um, for doing that. We identified four different types of mechanisms. So we have land use zoning, so where you zone off certain areas uh, for natural vegetation, other areas for agricultural development. And what that does is that it, it clarifies land tenure um, for people. They're then free to invest in increasing yields on areas that have been zoned for agriculture, but they can't expand into areas that have been, been zoned uh, for nature conservation. Uh, I won't go into them all in detail, but economic instruments, uh, strategic targeting of technology, infrastructure, and knowledge, and, and certification. So what all of these things can do is they can create a link between increasing yields and sparing land for nature, and I think that is what's needed. Um, and really, to talk a bit more about the requirements, I think that there is, at base, a need for firm political support for conservation, and that is lacking in, in many places. Without that, we're not going to make much progress, either with land sparing or with land sharing or anything in between um, without that political support. Um, and I think that needs to include a recognition that we have an ethical responsibility towards other species, that this is not just about providing ecosystem services for humans. It's not just about human well-being. It's about the ethical responsibility we have for other species. Um, we clearly need effective environmental governance, um, and there are examples of, of where that's happened. For example, in, in the Brazilian Amazon over the, the last 15 years, with enforcement of the forest code, the soy moratorium, and other measures, reduced deforestation dramatically. That is now at risk because of the political crisis, so that, that may not persist. Um, but it has shown an example of how it can with the right political will. Um, and then I think it's, as I said, it's really important for those involved in sustainable agriculture to make ending habitat loss a really key component um, of what they do. And equally, it's very important for conservation organizations to make supporting and respecting the demands of local and indigenous people a key part of what they do. Um, and that includes uh, their need for food sovereignty and self-determination. So I think if we can get both the, the agriculturalists to agree on ending habitat loss and conservationists to do more to support uh, self-determination of, of local communities, um, I think that we could make some progress. Yeah, and actually, I, I agree with everything that you say. Uh, I think that having more uh, environmental um, policies, you know, targeted specifically uh, for conservation is good. Uh, but I would argue that um, we need to do that regardless, no? And uh, basically, the political... Um, or the policies that we should be implementing instead of moving toward intensification of agriculture should be moving toward agroecological systems that actually result in food production and also maintain biodiversity uh, within those areas but also maintain a, a high quality matrix. Uh, so I think that we have a point on a, of agreement here and perhaps it's a matter of, of what we're calling intensification because your example of the silver pastoral system, you know, some people will call that land sharing. Um, and, and so I think that the problem that I have sometimes with the land sparing argument is that it's used as a justification for continuing business as usual in agriculture, for continuing intensifying agricultural production mm -hmm. uh, under the banner of feeding the world. And that's my biggest, uh, uh, not complaint, but, but I, I think that's one of the things that I think is most, most detrimental of the land sparing argument, is that it's being used uh, whether you like it or not, but it's being used to promote intensive monocultural systems. So I, I certainly agree with you that that's a risk and that is not something that I would, would like and want to see. Um, I don't think that ending global deforestation is business as usual. I don't think that's where business as usual is taking us. So I, I do think that 
if land sparing is taken seriously and adopted seriously, it's quite a radical departure from, from business as usual. And I also agree with you that we need to use the best of agroecological knowledge to increase yields. Also the best of agronomic knowledge. I don't think we should give up, for example, on synthetic uh, fertilizers. I, I think they play an incredibly important role in agriculture. But I think that if we use those sensibly and in moderation, alongside the best of agroecological knowledge, uh, we, can, we can increase yields in a way that is, has fewer environmental impacts. Um, I do think, though, that we shouldn't expect too much from uh, agroecological methods in terms of both increasing yields and preserving biodiversity within the farmed landscape. So the, the silver pastoral example I gave from Mexico, those systems can, be, can equal uh, the highest yielding conventional methods for cattle production, but they really don't provide habitat for very many uh, additional species, or at least very many of the species that are in most need of conservation concern. So we need, I think, to moderate our expectations of the biodiversity value of uh, high-yielding agroecological systems. Again, the, the, the Just main a final thing. Comment. <laughs> the, the main thing is the allowing the movement, softening that matrix so that there's movement, not that that particular site is going to be a source of, you know. Or a species, of course, it's not going to be. But the other thing that I will question, and maybe the, I don't know how much time we have, but the other thing that I will question is this emphasis on increasing production. We're producing 4,600 calories today. That's enough to feed you know, a population expected in the future. So I think that we should try to get away of this emphasis because emphasis in increasing productivity. Of course, you know, every farmer individually will like to produce more, but we already are producing uh, do almost double what we need to, uh, for, to satisfy the food demand in the world. Uh, and the other point that I made earlier is that most of the food is being produced by small-scale farmers, small and medium-scale farmers many of them using agroecological systems. So, um, I mean, I, I don't see why we need to emphasize so much the productivity aspect. So I think if I can quickly respond, because that's a really key point. Um, so the point of land sparing is not to increase production, it's to increase productivity, um, and in doing so, reduce the land area occupied by farming. So I think it's a really important distinction. Um, the point is not to produce more than we would produce with land sharing, <clears throat> but to produce differently, so to produce on less land. Um, and I agree with you that increasing production is one of the main threats to biodiversity globally, um, and finding ways to reduce food demand is, is going to be incredibly important. Thank you, finally, guys. <laughs> finally. finally one Thank you, guys. Thing. One little thing. No, no, you are going to have exciting. time. I'm, I'm sure that audience is full of questions. You can come back in, 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 in this okay. point again. And so it's time for the audience, for the questions. Maybe I, I need someone to help me <laughs> to, to take note, but I saw this late. <laughs> Thank you. This was really, really interesting. Um, you focused on, on conservation, uh, conserving biodiversity. What do both approach give us in terms of conserving soil, conserving water, uh, storing carbon, basically? Yeah, but that's that's extremely important question, and that's why I'm advocating for agroecological systems because it's not just conserving biodiversity but it's conserving many other resources, no? And also the fact that agroecological systems are going to uh, function in the longer term. When you intensify agriculture using more conventional methods, including applying fertilizers, is synthetic fertilizers, uh, you are in increasing the productivity temporarily. But eventually, because you're reducing biodiversity in those areas, eventually uh, a lot of the, of, of the ecosystem functions of that system start deteriorating. 
and so the production productivity is going to decline eventually. So those more intensive systems, conventional systems, are highly could be highly productive for a short period of time. Thank you. A question for Ben. Yeah, so this kind of relates to the previous question as well. So how do we think about ecosystem services and, and disservices, and how do we incorporate those? And to me, those are, those are other parts of the elephant um, that also need to be integrated here. What we know from some studies that have been done is that land sparing can result in higher total carbon stocks because you're preserving more forest. At the same time, you have higher uh, nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizers being used on farmland, um, wh where those are being used. And that's whether or not those are organic fertilizers or synthetic fertilizers. You still get nitrous oxide emissions if you're, if you're applying nitrogen, which you need. Um, but when you compare uh, land sparing with land sharing, land sparing comes out better because there is more carbon stored in those intact uh, native vegetation areas. So, um I, I think that's a really important question. Uh, I think that the land sparing strategy of concentrating forests in one area and then intensifying agriculture, this separation between agriculture and, 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 and natural habitats um, is detrimental under conditions of climate change. We're gonna see shift in the, in, in the range of species and if you put all your eggs in that basket of you know this area big area conserving uh the forest uh when those shifts occur there's less likely for those species to have to find a refuge from climate change that's one thing the other thing is you know, obviously agriculture is intensive agriculture Intensive agriculture is one of the biggest contributors to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and especially a fertilizer application increase uh, the amount of nitrous oxide. And, um, and so I, I would argue that agroecological systems are more resilient to climate change, number one, and also will contribute, especially agroforestry systems, will contribute to, um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. One question for this block. <laughs> you lady, please. Sorry, I have to random as much as possible. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, so a different question about a different part of the elephant. Um, people, somewhere in here. So you guys have both talked a lot about the ecology of these systems. But obviously, for long-term conservation, human nature interactions are fairly central. It seems a little bit obvious where people and their both intrinsic and utilitarian value sets interface with the land sharing perspective. But Ben, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the ability of land sparing, how it interacts with people, and what approaches you think are necessary to prevent the exclusion of people and the isolation of people away from these kinds of systems. Yeah, great question. So I, I would say two things about that. One is that land sparing is not about keeping people out of natural areas. It's about keeping agriculture out of natural areas. So we're looking at, we're looking at land use. And I think there are many ways in which people interact with the environment. Um, and our data only tell us about agricultural production. So it says that we should try and keep agricultural production out of native vegetation areas to the greatest extent possible. That does not uh, necessarily or at all imply that we should keep people out of those areas. So that's a really important question. And I think that conservation has, over the past uh, maybe decade or two, started to come to terms with a very oppressive uh, and colonialist past um, of fortress conservation, where people have been forcibly excluded um, from areas in the name of conservation. And I don't think that we can continue to justify that. I don't think it was ever justifiable. Land sparing is different from fortress conservation in that it pays attention to both areas of protected vegetation and also the agricultural areas outside that. And in terms of um, smallholder communities, indigenous people, I see support to those communities to produce food in ways that don't involve deforestation as a crucially important piece of the puzzle. 
Um, so I, I think that in the case of those communities, what's really needed is support. In the case of uh, corporate agriculture, in the case of companies, they already have the resources to increase yields. That's already what they're doing. So there, there's much more of a need for a stronger environmental regulation to restrict what they can do and restrict where they can expand into. Thank you, Ben. That, sorry, that guy over there from orange shirts, you? <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, both of you have commented on the fact that we don't need so much uh, food production. But this is a statement at, at a large scale. It's a statement at the global scale or perhaps the national regional scale. Farmers are always trying to increase their food production because that's their livelihood strategy. They're, they're looking to make more money and to find a pathway out of poverty. Um, I guess that's directed to me. <laughs> uh, Yes. Um, well, actually, I will argue with you that farmers are looking always to increase profits. Um, I work with a lot of farmers, and especially small-scale farmers, very rarely do they mention profit as one of their main motives. There, there are a lot of things that they are balancing and thinking about. And it's a lifestyle also, it's a preservation of a lifestyle. Uh, but you're right that every individual farmer, and that's why I say every individual farmer want to produce more. No? So the, the issue is how they make that, that work. And my, my argument is that through agroecological diversified systems, that allows farmers to increase their productivity uh, and also to diversify their productivity, which, which also would be of benefit for the livelihoods of the farmers and the farmer family. If I could briefly say on that. Um, so yeah, I think there's a diversity of strategies and, and objectives that farmers have. It's very hard to generalize. Uh, farmers that I've worked with, small farmers in Ghana, uh, in West Africa, uh, some of them, their main aim is to make enough money that they can send their children to school, that their children can go and get a job in the city, and that their, their children don't need to be farmers anymore. So I think there is a diversity of strategies that farmers have, and incorporating their desires and their needs um, into any strategy is incredibly important. Here. It's hard to hear. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for a very stimulating debate. I'd like to make a comment to both of you and a question. The comment is that I think that the debate is uh, very thought-provoking, but uh, false in a way, because it doesn't have to be one or the other. It has to be both land sharing and land sparing. And uh, to put that a little bit into context, I think that um, it would be very hard to decide if you wanted to do the land sparing to decide where uh, the more intensive productivity is going to be attained in you, if you have land tenure into that. If you have a lot of private land uh, landowners, uh, then you will have to assign to some of them, only some of them, the right to produce food. And to the others, you will have to deny it completely. On the other hand, you cannot always rely on just uh, mixed agricultural systems because it would, everything was like that, you wouldn't have the reserves, the untouched or at, as, at least touch as possible forests that are needed for specialist species, for all of the species that, many species that are going to be extinct, even if there can be recolonization, if you just don't have a big chunk of forest or um, natural ecosystem to serve as a source, it just, there will be massive extinction. So you need both of them. And um, the thing is, I think that land tenure systems like we have here in Mexico, in which still most of the land is owned by uh, the people, by the farmers, allows combining both of them. Because they are communally shared, the land. And you can have like big chunks of forest reserves and also diverse productive systems, maybe more intensive ones and maybe less intensive ones. But when there is private property 
most of the land is in private property, then I'm not sure uh, how to go about that. And that's the question for you, especially in that case where you don't have communal land like in Mexico, but most of the land is privately owned and with diverse interests, mostly people who want to produce and make money. What, what would be the case there? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think a lot depends on the context. So in landscapes where deforestation is continuing, where agricultural expansion is continuing, at least in the near term, the aim should be to stabilize that frontier. So to stop any further expansion and to increase yield on the land that's already been cleared. So in that kind of context, there isn't necessarily a need for anyone to give up their, their land that they're farming. It's more a need to consolidate production on land that's already been cleared and prevent any further clearance. In landscapes where there's no longer any clearance and where there are possibilities for restoration, I think the challenge is in finding ways of making that pay for landholders, so making that an attractive option. Um, and there are various people thinking about how to do that in different parts of the world. So I, I think it, it really does depend on the, the context. And I think those issues of equity and distribution of cost and benefits are a crucially important part of the elephant. I would like to, to restate the first part of my talk which is that the whole framing, the whole framing, land sparing, land sharing framing, uh, is based on three things that are not necessarily true. And so that, my main issue with this, frame, this uh, uh, debate, actually, is the framing. And if we assume that, you know, that land sharing, land sparing is either this or that, then uh, we are accepting those premises. The premise that we need to increase food production, the premise that land sparing actually does occur, you know, and which, which is not, not necessarily true, and the premise that only very intensive agriculture produce, uh, is able to produce enough food. And so, if you don't accept those premises, which I don't, then the whole framing falls apart. Uh, I think in, in, in answer to your question of, of the private, privatization of land and all that, I think that it is, it, is, it is a political question, no? And I think that we need to move uh, to a political strategy to basically um, take land from those very large landowners, basically, you know, big corporations that are uh, planting soybean, that are planting uh, oil palm, etc., that are grabbing land from the local population that is producing food, and redistribute that land. And you can produce more food for people by doing that. No, so a land redistribution is an essential component, I think, for the future uh, of, of the planet. Thank you. If I can quickly respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, my colleagues, but uh, you don't have much time. I'm sure that our colleagues, our talkers, will be available for the end of the meeting to attend your questions. Mm -hmm. And thank you again, Ben, and thank you. Thank you. Yvette, for uh, providing us this opportunity uh, to think about this very important question. If you want to take your seats, it's now time for voting again. So if you have already voted, if you change your mind, your opinion, it's time. And I hope this time it's going to. So this is the first question. Which strategy do you think is most critical for conserving tropical biodiversity? One or two minutes. Please, someone from the audience, take the results for me. 
let's wait for some stability. <laughs> okay, let's, let's move for the second question. Which strategy would be the best to solve the problems of hunger and malnourishment? Okay, thank you. Well, apparently, uh, most of people will still think that you must combine both strategies. Uh, and just uh, uh, to summarize this uh, or end this debate, uh, it's clear that uh, uh, one, one of the most uh, important aspects of this debate is in fact bring it to the stage, uh, the biological, the social, the political, and the economic arrangements, requirements for conserving biodiversity and uh, providing human welfare. So this debate, this topic, in fact, integrates a lot of problems, a lot of decisions you have to make uh, 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 in this perspective of conserving uh, biodiversity and providing better conditions for the human populations. So I think its debate is going uh, to keep for a long time uh, in, in, in the literature because it's highly complex, highly controversial, but you really need to think about this decision from biological requirements in one point from the political and the economic requirements to obtain what you need uh, human populations uh, have to have. So thank you a lot for our audience and thank you a lot your speakers, Vitor and the organizers of the ATBC. Thank you.